Well, I think we'll go ahead and start. So welcome. It's great to have you all here. I'm glad you've uh, made the time to do this. There should be on the table a workbook for everyone. And if by chance you, uh, there's not enough, let me know. Uh, we have some extras on the table over here. Also a paperback Bible for everyone. You may have brought your own Bible or maybe you like to use your Bible on your phone. The reason I give the same paperback Bible to everyone is because not everyone, when I say, well, we're going to look up Romans 8 or we're going to look up 1 Corinthians 13 or whatever, uh, some people can find it instantly and some people really struggle to find everything. And uh, this is not a class on how do you, are you quickest to find a verse in the Bible. You know, God doesn't give us extra grace because we know, you know, in order, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, and so forth. And so as not to embarrass anybody or make you feel uncomfortable, we've all got the same paperback Bible. And so if I say we're going to look up 1 Corinthians 13, I'll say it's on page whatever, and then it's just easier for everybody. Um, I also want you to know that I am not going to call on anybody. I'm not going to put you on the spot. Uh, I'm not going to put you in a position where you feel uncomfortable. Um, many, some of the people who come to our Bible investigation class come enthusiastically and passionately and willingly and cheerfully, and some come because their spouse drugged them or their mother-in-law drugged them or their sibling, you know, said, I'm going to give you, I'm going to keep pestering you until you come. Uh, and so I don't want to put anybody on the spot or ask you to do anything that's going to make you feel uncomfortable. So just know that up front, I'm not going to ask you to read the scriptures out loud. Uh, you are always welcome to ask questions or make comments. You are always welcome to do that and just, just shoot it out. You don't have to raise your hand or anything, but just uh, you're welcome to do that. And then I also, though, put a 3 by 5 or 4 by 6 card on all the tables because my observation is that with a room full of people, some people aren't necessarily comfortable asking questions or making comments. And so, but they are comfortable writing their question down. So if you have a question that you want to ask, and you would prefer to do it that way, uh, just jot it down, and when we afterwards collect the sheets with your names on it, I'll have that, and then next week I will do my best to address whatever questions you had. You can put your name on it if you want the question. Uh, you don't have to, so just know it's not necessary. If it would be helpful for me to know who that is, uh, or it may be that we have a conversation on the side. Maybe it's not a conversation with everybody. Maybe it's one on the side. So. Um, anyway, that's what that is. There are some name tags on most of the tables. That's just so that people like, if you know everybody at your table, that's fine, but not everybody does. And so I just want to encourage you to get to know one another. Um, my uh, opinion is that a relationship with Jesus is not just a vertical relationship between us and God, but it's also a horizontal relationship and our relationship with other people. And I think some folks just see Christianity as God and me. When in reality, when you observe Jesus, a relationship with Jesus is about a relationship with all of his creation, but especially with, with other human beings. And so my desire is that in our time together, you'll kind of get to know one another a little bit better. Again, not putting you on the spot. We'll do a little thing today around your tables that will be very painless, and ev I'm sure everybody will be fine with that. Uh, but just to let you know in regards to that. My experience has been, having taught this uh, a few times, is that, um, that there are some folks who come to our Bible investigation class who could teach it. There are people in this room who could stand up here where I am and you could teach this class and you would do a great job. Um, there are other people who come to our Bible investigation class who maybe are in worship on a regular basis, but maybe they've not been in a Bible study for a while. And so this is kind of new to dig into the scriptures and to examine some of that. There are some people who come to our Bible investigation class who maybe they were as kids brought up in the church and they went to church and Sunday school up through elementary school or junior high or even high school. But at a certain point, you just kind of faded off. And those things in relation to the church, uh, for whatever reason, weren't a part of your life. And so it's been a long time since you've been connected. And then we have other folks who come to our Bible investigation class who maybe the only time they've been in a church in the last five or 10 years is for somebody's baptism or confirmation or a funeral or something like that. Um, and so I want you to know that we're really starting at a basic level as we talk about things. But my experience has been that even those who, are, who could be teaching the class might pick up one or two things along the way. And so certainly that's my hope as we, as we do um, uh, all of this. Uh, this, is a, this class, my, my desire is this. Not, so a number of you who are here today are a part of our St. Peter's congregation. Uh, officially, your name's on the roster. And there are others of you who are here today 
Um, that's not the case. Maybe you don't have a church home anywhere, or maybe you have a church home somewhere else, and you're considering making St. Peter's your church home. My goal in this never has been a Bible investigation class to twist anybody's arm to get you to sign on the dotted line to be an official member of St. Peter's Lutheran Church. It's my opinion that in God's eyes, uh, whether uh, we are a member of this church or that church is not the most important thing. Or whether on the front of our jersey we have an L for Lutheran or an M for Methodist or a B for Baptist or a P for Presbyterian or whatever is not the ultimate thing. Ultimately, what God desires is a relationship with us and to see us live out that relationship with him and our relationship with one another. So my desire for all of us in our Bible investigation class is that we come into a deeper relationship with the living God and that we are inspired and encouraged to live out that relationship with one another. That's my goal. So uh, I'm not going to come to anybody who's not on the roster of St. Peter's at a certain point and say, here, sign on the dotted line. I'm not a, a salesman. And that's not my goal. My goal is that every single one of us, regardless of where we are in our journey, will come to know uh, God a little bit better, come to appreciate him more fully, maybe have some questions answered that we didn't have answers to, uh, but that we're inspired and really motivated to live out what it means to live out the Christian faith. One of the verses that I like to use to introduce this is from uh, uh, John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, we find Jesus visiting a guy named uh, Zacchaeus. And Zacchaeus, uh, if you don't know, Zacchaeus was a tax collector. And in Jesus' day, tax, well, in our day, tax collectors aren't exactly loved, right? Uh, and so, uh, so in Jesus' day, though, the Israel, uh, Palestine, actually it was Palestine where Jesus lived, um, they had been, for centuries, they had been conquered by neighboring uh, countries. So, and we'll see it a little bit later, and I'll put it up on the map, but if you go back to the, the, seventh, the 8th century B.C. in 722 B.C., so Jesus was born around, actually, actually there's question about when they set the dating. Probably he was born about 4 or 5 B.C., which can Jesus be born before Christ? But if they, when they went back and redid some of that, they probably miscalculated. Uh, that doesn't change the effectiveness of the scriptures. The scriptures don't give those years. Um, but what we find is when they went back in time, they probably made a mistake. But in the year 722 B.C., so about 700 and some years before Jesus was born, the Assyrians, which is up where Turkey is now, came down from the north, and they conquered the, the land known now as Israel or Palestine. So then the people who lived in that land, uh, the Hebrew peoples, the Jewish peoples, they uh, were forced to pay taxes to Assyria and to live according to the Assyrian rules. And then uh, uh, after that, in the year 586 B.C., uh, the uh, Babylonians came uh, from the east, if you saw the movie, uh, was it 300? Uh, the movie 300, very bloody, very gory. Uh, but in that movie, that was a story about how the Babylonians came and they conquered uh, the land. So they conquered the Assyrians. And the movie 300 is about how the Babylonians tried to move further to the west up against, uh, yeah, up against Greece and all of that. After the Babylonians had conquered, then the Persians came and they conquered the land. So now they're paying taxes to the Persians. After the Persians came, then the Greeks came a little bit later, and now the people who live in Bethlehem, Jerusalem, all that area, are bowing down to the Greeks, and then after the Greeks came the Romans. So the people who lived in the land of Jesus had been answering to uh, another nation for eight, eight centuries, and they were tired of it. And so what happened under the Romans was the Romans said, listen, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to bid out the job of tax collector. So I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to bid this job out. So whoever comes you know, to work out the best deal with Rome, he'll be the tax collector. So what the tax collector would do is the tax collector knew you. So if the tax collector knew uh, Larry Nordman, and he says, Larry's a good guy, and his taxes are $1,000, and so I'm going to charge him 1050 because I need something to make a living. So they charge 1050 and you can't go online and everything else. They don't know what their taxes are. So Larry would pay, write him a check for 1050 and we're good. But if the tax collector knows Mark Case, who's kind of an ornery guy, and he says, listen, I, I, Mark's taxes are $1,000, but I'm going to charge him 1500 
Mark can't argue with it because Mark doesn't really know what his taxes are, but the tax collector is sending 1,000 back to Rome, but he's pocketing 500. And so people didn't like the tax collectors. Tax collector, that was a good living. I mean, you could make, you could make good money. And, and so Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and he worked for Rome. In fact, one of Jesus' apostles, a guy named Matthew, was a tax collector. And Jesus came to him, and it's amazing because Jesus says, listen, I don't care your background. Uh, I care about you. You matter to me. So whatever your background, whatever your past, I, I know about it, but you matter to me. And I want to redeem you. I want to make a difference in your life. I want to use you. I want you to work as my agent to make a difference in the world. And, and he says that to everybody. And, and Matthew was a tax collector, and Jesus came to Matthew one day and said, Matthew, I got something better for you. Forget about that life of tax collecting. You're not going to make as much money, but I guarantee you uh, the, the life is going to be much more rewarding and the eternal rewards are going to be a whole lot better. So Zacchaeus was a tax collector and Jesus was coming through uh, the town of Jericho. And Jericho is near the, uh, uh, the Jordan River. Jericho is um, the juiciest oranges I ever made, ate in my life came from Jericho. <laughs> Jericho is like uh, uh, an oasis. So that part of, and I'll show a map a little bit later, but that part of the world uh, is just desolate. It's barren. It's Gretchen. You can hold me accountable on this because Gretchen's been there as well. Uh, but Jericho's like an oasis. And they've got these, you know, very juicy uh, oranges. Well, so anyway, when Jesus was coming down, this is the week of his crucifixion, he and his disciples were traveling from the Galilee up north, and they came down through Jericho. And then you would come through Jericho and then go west to Jerusalem. You'd go through the Judean wilderness, and, and we'll look at all that and talk about all that. But in Jericho, the people had heard about Jesus. His popularity had grown. They heard about how he called a dead man, Lazarus, out of the tomb, how he'd given sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf and done all these things, walked on the water. And they wanted to get an eye, a look at Jesus. So he comes to Jericho, and the crowd's waiting for him. And Zacchaeus, who was a tax collector, it says he was a, a the, the song says, a wee little man. He was a short guy, wasn't very tall. And so when you line up for a parade, you know, when we do the Festival of Lights parade, you know, the kids can get up front and they might sit on the curb. And, and, uh, and if a child comes at the last minute, they'll let the child scoot in there. But, uh, but Zacchaeus wasn't very tall. So he couldn't see over the crowds when the people were lined up to see him. But he was Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector. Nobody cared if he wasn't very tall. You're a tax So Zacchaeus had to climb up in a tree. So Zacchaeus climbs up on the tree. So we're on Washington Street, and the Festival of Lights parade is going down Washington Street, and Jesus is coming down there, and Zacchaeus climbs up in one of the trees, and Jesus is coming down the street, and he looks up in the tree, and he sees Zacchaeus. And he says, Zacchaeus, listen, I want you to come down from the tree because I want to go to your house. I want to have a conversation with you. So Zacchaeus, and the people are thinking, what? He's a tax collector. Why would you give him the time of day? And isn't it interesting how Jesus gives um, the outcasts the time of day? And I think he calls us as his agents to give those who seem to be downtrodden and ignored and looked down upon and those who don't really have much of a voice in society to give them the time of day. In fact, that's part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. It's not about looking out for number one. It's not about building the power structure. It's about loving the least of these and walking alongside those who are broken. So Z Jesus says, Zacchaeus, go to my house. I, or I go to your house, prepare a meal. I want to come and talk to you. And, uh, and when Zacchaeus was done talking to Jesus that day, his life was radically transformed. Radically transformed. Because of the hour, two hours, three hours Jesus spent with him. I know there are other things you could be doing on Sunday morning. There are other places you could be. My desire is, my hope is, my prayer is that because you, like Zacchaeus, have made the effort to be here for these Sunday mornings for the next few months, uh, that your life will be impacted in a positive way. And that you'll say, I'm glad we did it. And that it was worth the time. Because we met Jesus every week and we encountered Jesus and we learned more about what it means to follow after Jesus and we want that to be um, the goal of our life. So that's my desire in, in, in all of this. Um, on your table, you've got a, uh, a white sheet that, where you can put your name. That's just helpful for me. So 
if, for example, so like last night, I'm coming home from our Saturday night service, and it's raining, and the first thing that crosses my mind, and it was 33 degrees, and the first thing that crosses my mind is, is this going to freeze, and what's tomorrow morning going to be like? And sometimes that happened. Then I looked at my phone, and ah, the temperature was going up. But it may happen that on a Saturday night, we get a sheet of ice or whatever, and I need to contact you all quickly, and I don't want to pick up the phone to call everybody, um, but I can send a group email. So if you would just on those papers, be sure to put your name uh, and your email address, and I think I ask for your phone number maybe, uh, or whatever I ask for. If you'd put that on there, that's just for my purposes. That n I don't give that to anybody else. We don't sell that. <laughs> Nobody's gonna come soliciting, but that just is helpful for me so that I can make sure that you uh, have that um, information. Okay, and then also there's a camera back here. We record every session because I know it's not realistic to expect everybody to be here every week. It just doesn't happen. In fact, I talked to a husband and a wife this morning after the 8 o'clock service, and they said, uh, we want to come to the class, um, but they're going to be out of town for a number of weeks. So what we'll do is uh, that will be recorded, and then Dean will put that on our YouTube channel. So if you miss a week, uh, then you can go to, I don't know if you'll post that on Sunday or Monday or Tuesday or when, but you can pull that up on the YouTube channel, and it will have, now my preference is you're here in person. So I'm not saying, well, then just don't show up. But um, if you have to, that's available in that way. And if you need it, we can make a copy of that. If you're not into computers and all that, so we can make, uh, put that on, um, on a, CD, a DVD or a jump drive. Okay, so we just need to know that, whatever you, uh, whatever you need uh, to make that happen. One of the things that I want to do as we, um, as we begin each week is uh, there, there are two things. Uh, most of our time will be spent in conversation about the material that we're talking about. Um, but uh, I also want to give you kind of a little more, there's some people at St. Peter's, we have like sixth and seventh generation families at St. Peter's. St. Peter's was founded in 1858, and we have some families that have been here forever. In fact, one of the founding families here, their last name was Keel. Well, we still have Keels who are here, and we probably have people in this room. I don't know that we have any Keels in the room, but people who are related in some way to the Keels. But we have the Burbrinks and the Sturtlemeyers and the Finkies and the Arnholtz and the Armiths and these farming families that have been here forever and ever and ever and ever. But we also have some people who are here who probably struggle to even find this room today. You don't know St. Peter's. You don't know its history. And so I want you to, as much as possible, start to feel like an insider. One of the things, well, my wife's taught me a lot of things, but uh, Debbie has a material called The Art of Invitation. And The Art of Invitation is a study that talks about how do we build and restore relationships, whether that's in a marriage or in the workplace or in the church or wherever that is. And... Uh, and uh, in, in, in part of that uh, material, she talks about how some people feel like insiders and some people feel like outsiders. And that can be true in a church. You can be in a church uh, for 15 years and feel like an outsider. If you don't feel like you have a voice, or if you don't feel like your voice is being heard, or if you feel ignored, or whatever that might be. Um, and so my desire is that you kind of know the stories. Last... Uh, uh, about a year ago or nine months ago, I was in Orlando, Florida. Uh, one of my, there were about six or seven of us who grew up from kindergarten through high school, and then we've stayed in touch. Um, and uh, the first one of our spouses passed away uh, about nine months ago. And this was a friend who lives in Orlando, and his wife passed away. So there were about five or six of us who came from different parts of the country to be there for her funeral. And as we were having dinner uh, the night uh, of the funeral, there was an individual who was a friend of my friend who went to college with him. Well, he didn't know all of our stories. You know, he grew up in the northern part of Illinois. We all grew up in, in central Illinois in Decatur, and we all were telling stories, and I kind of felt like, oh, he's, he's out of this. So I tried to ask him some questions to draw him in. And so uh, while a lot of people in this room know all the inside stories, some of you don't. So each week as we begin, I'm going to show a 90-second video that just shows a little bit of the life and history of St. Peter's. These videos were made like 12 years ago, but they're still applicable because they tell the story from 1858 going forward. And uh, some of you are going to uh, hear things that you didn't know. Some of you will 
say things, yep, that's, that's the truth. So let me, wa let me show this video. It's 90 seconds. It says no signal. So let's see what happened here. And um, oh, I guess I just have to log in again. Okay. Uh, we don't want that. That's what I get when I keep talking so long and then it doesn't. St. Peter's Lutheran Church. Oops, oops. Yeah, they call me Mr. Technology, too. <laughs> St. Peter's Lutheran Church began out of necessity 150 years ago due to a travel hazard. In the mid-1850s, a number of families in Columbus were attending St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Clifty, four miles southeast of Columbus. St. Paul's itself was formed to provide services to the large number of German immigrants in the area. However, a number of Lutheran families residing in Columbus were not able to attend church on a regular basis. Trips to St. Paul's were often hazardous and for children too dangerous, as Clifty Creek had to be crossed at a treacherous and deceptive place known as Fatal Ford. After heavy rains, this ford was impassable and all lowlands were flooded, prohibiting travel to and from church. In one remembered instance, a buggy was washed downstream a short distance while attempting to ford the flooded creek on the way to church. When the creek was too high to ford, the Madison Railroad Bridge was used. This was the first railroad built in Indiana. Walking on the bridge wasn't easy either. Long steps were necessary from one railroad tie to the next, with muddy floodwaters clearly visible below. Some adults had to carry children who might be crying from fright, making the trip even more difficult. These were the conditions church members sometimes faced after heavy rains. And so, in January of 1858, the decision was made to form a new congregation in Columbus, known as St. Peter's Lutheran Church. So uh, we had these videos made uh, in, uh, what was it, 20, 2008. That was the 150th anniversary of St. Peter's. And we had uh, a lot of uh, written records, and so we had a team of people. Mildred Smith, some of you know the name of Mildred Smith. Mildred went to heaven a few years ago. She lived to be like 103 years old. And a lot of the records were in German. And uh, who of us can read German? Not very many, but Mildred could. In fact, Mildred... Uh, Mildred, her maiden name was Gutenecht, good German name, and when Mildred was a little girl, the services were still in German. And it wasn't until uh, World War I uh, when uh, St. Peter's and a lot of other uh, Lutheran churches stopped doing their services in German uh, because, you know, the Lutheran roots go back to Germany, and the people who formed the Lutheran congregations were folks who had uh, emigrated uh, from Germany. Uh, but in World War I, all of a sudden, the Germans became the bad guys. And so it was not a popular thing to speak German in the United States because you were suspect. And that's what, for, we may still be doing our services in German if it wasn't for the World War I or World War II. So they stopped doing the services in German and did them in English. But when Mildred was a little girl, the services were in German. And her parents wanted her to speak English. They lived in the United States. She wanted, they wanted her to speak English. So she never learned German. So Mildred would sit in the, san the sanctuary that's torn down and there were stained glass windows in that sanctuary. And during this sermon, she would study the stained glass windows because they had Bible stories in them, many of them. And uh, when we were going to uh, bring down the old sanctuary, Mildred came to me and said, what are you going to do with those windows? I said, I, we never even asked the question, Mildred. And she told about how precious those were to her. And so Mildred and her husband Harry had no children, and uh, they were conservative with their money. And she said, I'd like to pay to have those windows removed and then stored, and when the appropriate time comes, if ever, to, uh, to use them in some kind of a building, we can do that. So we still have those windows stored. They didn't seem to fit very well in a gym, and so maybe there's something else where down the road where those windows um, can be used. But So Mildred translated all that German stuff, and then we had uh, uh, Bob Taylor, um, who kind of then wrote a script from all of that, and uh, Brian Rawlings, whose voice it is, was the narrator, 
and I don't know who was the camera person, and they put these together for 150th anniversary. So we'll watch one of those each week along the way. Here's what I'd like you to do for just a couple of minutes around your table. We talked about, again, getting to know each other. So what I'd like you to do is, and some of you know each other very, very well, so maybe you want to mix in other tables. That's up to you. But I, uh, give us your name, where did you grow up, and tell us something significant about your hometown. So I would say my name is Mark Tyke. I grew up in Decatur, Illinois. And Decatur, Illinois is the, uh, uh, the hometown of the Chicago Bears. So the Chicago Bears were called the Decatur Staleys, uh, where George Hallis was a player coach. If you go to downtown Decatur on the side of a building, they've got a mural from back when the Decatur Staleys started until they actually into Chicago. Um, and so that's what I would say about my hometown. So do that around your table, and I'll give you like a two-minute warning, and then we'll come back, okay? So go ahead and do that. <laughs> Take about two more minutes, minute and a half, minute and a half, two more minutes. Okay, I'm going to cut you off at this point, and we'll have time uh, during different weeks to take some time to get to know each other. And, and if you want to sit at the same table every week with each other, you can do that. If you want to move around and get to know some new folks, you can do that. If you'll open up in the workbook uh, that we have here, and, uh, and again, I, I don't grade anything, so I have like some fill in the blanks and that kind of stuff. That's just to engage you a little bit more. They say, you know, if you just listen to somebody, you retain so much. If you make notes, you retain a little bit more. If you act on it, you retain even more. So you can do with that whatever you want. And I just want you to know, I don't want you to panic because we will not get through this section on the Bible today. We may not get all the way through it next week. 
It'll be either next week or the week after that when we finish. If we're not finished after three weeks on that section, I'm in trouble, okay? But I just, so don't worry about that because some people are real concerned. They're very orderly and detailed and like, man, we, we didn't get anywhere near done with that and are we in trouble? Uh, I've done it a few times and so we're okay. But so uh, what is the Bible? Um, uh, this is a Bible investigation class. So this, this class really isn't about comparative religions. I mean, I may make reference on occasion to uh, here's a, an understanding of in Hinduism of who God is or Buddhism of who God is or Islam or who God is or who's Jesus compared to Muhammad or something like that. But this is not a class on comparative uh, religions. This is a Bible investigation class. Nor is this a class uh, to compare uh, what are Lutherans opposed to Methodists, opposed to Baptists, opposed to Presbyterians. Because you know what? Those of us who are in the church are supposed to be on the same team. We're the body of Christ. And Jesus in John 17 prayed for the unity of his church. So it's not my goal to say, well, this is why the Lutherans are right over everybody. No. You know, we may get to heaven and find out there was something we were wrong about. <laughs> but so that's, we're not here to say, now there may be on occasion where we're talking about the Lord's Supper and the understanding of the real presence in the Lord's Supper. And here, this is a Roman Catholic understanding or this is a Reformed understanding. But the purpose of this is a Bible investigation class. So we're going we're gonna to begin in what's the Bible and where does it come from and what's all in it. And so those are our first couple of weeks. So, and then we're going to be diving into Bible verses then after that. Uh, but for today, first of all, the word Bible simply means book. It comes from the, the Latin word Biblia. Uh, when I was in high school, we were required to learn a foreign language, and the language that I took was French, and I don't remember a lot of it. But I do know that that building across the street from our friends at First Christian Church in French is called a bibliothèque. Biblio, Biblia. The word Bible simply means book. And in that bibliothèque, in that library that we have across the street from First Christian, are thousands and thousands and thousands of Bibles. Now, not thousands and thousands and thousands of what we call the Holy Bible. So we have a, an adjective in front of the word Bible to describe it that it's holy, but the word Bible just means book. The word scripture, sometimes it's referred to as the scriptures, a scripture is just a writing. So we talk about a manuscript. And, and different faith traditions have different uh, scriptures. So the Muslims have the Quran. Uh, the Hindus have the Vedas. Uh, the, uh, the, the Mormons have the Pearl of Great Price and the Book of Mormon. Um, the Jehovah Witnesses have what they call their Watchtower uh, articles. So different, different faith traditions have different sets of scriptures. And the word scripture simply means writings. Now, why do we call this uh, holy? The holy scriptures or the holy Bible? Because the word holy means, among other things, unique or one of a kind. It's different. Um, and, and you will find out that, that I would not put this on equal par with the Quran or the Veda. I remember once I had been invited to uh, Columbus North High School, and uh, the kids were in a, like a religions class, and the, uh, the students were invited to, if they wanted to, they could invite their pastor or somebody to come and talk about uh, their faith tradition and what made them unique. So I remember being there once, and, uh, uh, and I didn't get invited back, uh, but I was there once, and, uh, and there's a story behind that. I was nice. I really was nice, uh, but the teacher probably uh, didn't view things th through the same eyes that I did from a faith perspective, and there were some students in the class, and they said, because they came from, a, and I, I knew the perspective from which they came, and um, uh, there are people who like to knock on doors, and um, so they said to me, well, you say that you believe that because it's in the Bible, but surely there, there are extra revelations from God. Surely God gives additional revelations over time where he speaks and that we should pay attention. And I said, I believe with all my heart that God can speak apart from the scriptures. I hear about people in Africa who come to faith through a dream that they have. I mean, God can speak in different forms. But what I also believe and what I said was, if, if somebody says, well, God said this or God revealed this to me, I'm always going to line it up with this. 
So if somebody says, well, God suggested this, or God told me I should do this, or somebody says, I believe this is a revelation from God, I know this is from God, because Jesus addresses that. So anything else that I'm going to line up to say, well, was that from God or not, is if it's in sync with this, then I'm not going to push back. If it's not in sync with this, then I'm going to say, well, let's, let's, let's talk about that. So uh, the Holy Scripture is because it's unique, it's different, it's, it's one of a kind. Um, so if we, uh, the Bible is divided into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And if you flip the page, you'll see that I have kind of a table of comments, uh, contents there for the Bible. Some of you said, Mark, this is, I know all this stuff. I know you do. I know you do. It's, it's broken down into, so the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all the way to Malachi, uh, those books were written between the year 1500 B.C. and 1400 B.C., approximately. We don't know exactly, approximately. So over a period of 1100 years there, uh, we find the writings of Moses uh, all the way through uh, Malachi, B.C., standing for before Christ. Now, in the culture in which we live today, sometimes the, the letters B.C. and A.D. have kind of gone away. So if we read in literature today, we may see uh, B.C.E. instead of B.C.E. B.C. B.C.E. means before the Christian era. Okay? Or instead of A.D., we may see C.E. C.E. simply means Christian era. Now, why is that a big deal? When I, years ago, that used to really irritate me. And I thought, Mark, get over it. Get over it. Because not everybody, we say be before Christ, but not everybody believes that Jesus is the Christ. So in a world that's very diverse, instead of saying before Christ, that used to really irritate me, but now it's like, big, no big deal. So before the Christian era. The Christian era began with Jesus, right? And, and A.D. is the Latin Anno Domini. Anno, like an annual year, Domini, uh, uh, Latin for Lord. So year of our Lord. But Jesus isn't the Lord of everybody. So in order to make that more palatable for the 8 billion people on the face of the earth, uh, they use BCE before the Christian era and CE Christian era. So if you see dates that way that say CE, that's what that means. I don't think we need to worry about it. Sometimes we get, uh, it's, and there are a lot of Christians today who get so bent out of shape over things they don't need to get bent out of shape over. It's not that big of a deal. But we want to rise up and get all upset. I think Jesus called us to love our neighbor. So let's, 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 you know, let's seek to understand our neighbor. Instead of saying, well, you don't, you don't use the language. Get over it. It's not a big deal. Um, and then the New Testament was condensed in a much shorter period of time. Uh, from about 50 A.D. until about 100 A.D. or C.E. So Jesus was crucified around 30 A.D. or 30 C.E. Um, and so about 20 years after the, the uh, crucifixion of Jesus, then we began to gather uh, those writings. For what it's worth, you don't need to know this to get into heaven. It might help you if you're playing like Jeopardy or Bible Trivia or something like that. But the Old Testament's written in Hebrew and the New Testament is written in Greek. And the only reason I point that out is because there may be times, and we'll do this in here on occasion, where the English language really is not nearly as clear as some of the other languages. So if we just say, for example, the word love, you know, how do you interpret that? Uh, somebody says, I love you, or I don't love him anymore, or, or act in love. In the, in the Greek language, which is the language of the New Testament, oh, there are four different words for love. Uh, the word... Um, uh, uh, phileo, which means a uh, feeling of love. Um, the city of Philadelphia is oftentimes referred to as the city of brotherly love, not because it's the friendliest city in the world. If you've ever been a sports fan or watched sports in Philadelphia, they are brutal on their teams when they're not performing. About 20 years ago, Santa Claus got bombarded with snowballs at a Philadelphia Eagle football game. Philadelphia is not necessarily the friendliest city in the world, <clears throat> but Philadelphia is from two Greek words. The word phileo, which means a feeling of love, and adolphos, which means brother. So the reason they call Philadelphia the city of brotherly love is not because it's the friendliest city in the world, because literally translated, that's what the word means. 
So phileo is a feeling of love. So we may have phileo love for a lot of folks. I feel love for my wife, for my kids, for my grandkids, for my, for my parents, for <coughs> some of my friends. Then there's a word, eros, E-R-O-S. That refers to, uh, from which we get the word erotic. That refers to a sexual kind of love. So I may feel love, phileo, for a lot of folks. Uh, but if, my, if I demonstrate eros love towards anybody other than my wife, I'm in big trouble, right? So that's another kind of love. There's the word storge. And storge is a, what they call a familial, a family kind of love. You know, sometimes family, you, 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 you can't, live without them and you can't live with them, you know. <laughs> our family, we, we have phileo love for our family, but, but sometimes we just don't even want to be in the same room with them. Now, maybe that's never true with any of your family, but <laughs> it's been that way in my family on occasion. And then there's the word agape. And the word agape is a love that talks about a love of action, a love that's demonstrated. So in the book of uh, Romans, chapter 5, verse 8, it says, God demonstrated his love for us. That's the word agape. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's agape. Or in John 3, 16, that's agape. For God so agape, a love the world that he gave his only begotten son. Or in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, love isn't jealous or boastful. That's the word agape. So there are different kinds of love. And when God, when God says, when Jesus says, love your enemies, he uses the word agape. Treat your enemies with kindness. Treat them with, go back to 1 Corinthians 13, be patient with your enemies. Be kind toward your enemies. Don't be judgmental toward your enemies. Don't keep a record of wrong of your enemies. This is where our, our Christianity, where the rubber hits the road. So on occasion, we'll unpack that. There may be a word in the, in the scriptural account that we're looking at where we need to kind of unpack that and have a better understanding of, uh, of all of that. Uh, then, in the Old Testament, there are 39 books. In the New Testament, 27. Uh, but ultimately, everything in the Bible points us to Jesus. Everything ultimately points us to the person of Jesus. I believe that the most important theological question that any of us will ever have to answer or th consider is, who's Jesus? Who's Jesus? So, um, what I'd like to do now is for us to take a look at the table of contents. So, if you'll go to the next page... And uh, I'll show you a, a little map as we kind of look at um, some biblical times. This map pretty much covers everything uh, in the days of, uh, of the scriptures. So uh, Adam and Eve, uh, we're in the Garden of Eden. Uh, where's the Garden of Eden? There are different opinions. I'm going to give you mine. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, the Bible in the book of Genesis says that the Garden of Eden is surrounded by four rivers, the Tigris River, the Euphrates River, and two other rivers. The Tigris and Euphrates still exist. We know where they are. The other two rivers, we don't know where they exist. And so where is that? Here's the Euphrates River. Here's the Tigris River. We know that Abraham lived in the land of Ur. I believe that the Garden of Eden was right around here, where modern-day Iraq is now located. Some people will say, well, uh, I I've had, heard people ask on occasion, where did people of color come from? Where did people of color come from? And my question is, what makes you think Adam and Eve were white? Because I only hear white people ask that question. I don't hear people of color ask, where did people of color come from? Although actually, my friend Alan Smith once said to me as we were having a conversation about this, and, and Alan is, is African American, and Alan said, really, Mark, the reality is probably pe white people are more colored uh, than people of color because like when you get embarrassed, what, well, we, we turn red, right? Well, when we go out in the sun, we turn brown. I thought that was an interesting thought. I think it's, it's worth considering. But Adam and Eve, I believe, now other people will disagree with that in light of they'll, they'll talk about the flood and how things could have been moved around. But I believe Adam and Eve lived right around here. And then we read about Abraham. Now, Abraham lived about 2,000 years before the time of Jesus. And Abraham uh, moved up in this direction and then came down here to the land of Palestine. And, uh, and, so, and then when we read about Moses and the Exodus, um, all of that took place here in Egypt. Down here is Mount Sinai, where God gave them the Ten Commandments. And then uh, they came up here and crossed the Jordan River, came through Jericho, and then there's Jerusalem. And Bethlehem is about five miles south of Jerusalem. And the life and ministry of Jesus happened in this area. And then after Jesus ascended into heaven, he told his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. 
And so the disciples then went off to different parts of the world. Uh, Thomas went to uh, India, which is down in this way. Uh, some went to Africa. Uh, some went up here into Asia Minor, where Turkey is now located. The Apostle Paul went to like Greece and Rome and Athens and those areas. So almost everything in the Bible took place um, in this area. And I'd, be, I'd use the, uh, the red thing, except it doesn't show up on the screen. So uh, we'll pick up on that as we, as we move forward. So Genesis. You see the bracket around Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy? If you'd write the name Moses there, because Moses was the author of those five books. Sometimes we refer to those five books as the Pentateuch. Again, you don't need to know this to get into heaven. Uh, but Penta means five, like the Pentagon has five sides. And so the Pentateuch uh, were the first five books of the Bible. It's also referred to as the Torah. And the Torah uh, is the, are the writings of Moses as God gave to him those, those words. And what we find is that Jesus was a student of the Torah. And everything that Jesus really taught is found in the Torah. So it would be wise for us to learn what does Genesis say in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and, and Deuteronomy and so forth. So the word Genesis, if you want to write on the line to the right of Genesis, it means beginnings. That's what the word Genesis means, beginnings. Barashith, the first word in the book of Genesis means in the, well, you can go much deeper, but it means in the beginning, in the beginning. In the book of Genesis, we read about the beginning of creation. We read about the beginning of the, of the human race. We read about the beginning of the nation of Israel. So Genesis is about beginnings. And there are a lot of good stories in the book of Genesis about creation, Adam and Eve, um, uh, the fall, um, uh, the Tower of Babel, um, Noah and the flood, uh, Joseph and the coat of many colors. Next to Exodus, write the word exit or go out because that's what Exodus is all about. So uh, Moses uh, uh, leads the people here out of Egypt, uh, across the Red Sea, and to Mount Sinai, and up to the Promised Land. So Exodus is about their journey out of slavery, out of bondage, and we'll unpack that when we talk about the Passover and the Lord's Supper, but that's what that's about. Leviticus, if you want, you can write next to Leviticus the word uh, Levites, L-E-V-I-T-E-S, or slash laws, L-A-W-S. Because Leviticus is, um, it's not all about this, but there are a lot of like, you know, the, the Levites were like the priests, they were like the religious leaders, and so like if, you're, what, if your ox falls in a ditch, uh, uh, what, what can you do to help it out, you know, or how far can you walk on the Sabbath, and all those kinds of things. And if you're going to read through the Bible, you say, I'm going to read from Genesis all the way to Revelation, <laughs> you read in Genesis, and it's good, juicy stuff, Exodus, good stuff, and then Leviticus, and it's almost like you're in fifth gear, cruising down the highway, and you automatically downshift into second. That's kind of like Leviticus. It's not the most exciting reading in the world, but it's there, which means it's important. But some scripture has probably greater importance than others. Numbers, next to the word numbers, you can write the word census, C-E-N-S-U-S, -S, census, because in numbers, and while there are other things there, but in the book of numbers, it'll say, you know, like so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so begat, so-and-so. And for us, that's boring. We may skip over that, but there's significance to that. If you look in the Gospel of Matthew uh, and, and uh, Luke, you'll find the genealogy of Jesus. You say, what's the big deal? Because throughout the Bible, we find God dropping little clues so that when Messiah comes, so we know, first of all, we know in Genesis that the Messiah is going to be a human being. It's not going to be an extraterrestrial. It's not going to be an angel. It's not going to be an eagle. It's, it's going to be a human being. And then he says he'll be a descendant of Abraham. And, and then he'll be a descendant of Isaac, and be a descendant of Jacob, and a descendant of Judah. And he gives all the, and so, so when Messiah comes, Matthew then lists the genealogy of Jesus, and it all fits. So we may think genealogies aren't important, they're very significant, and they had great significance in the Jewish mindset. And then Deuteronomy. Next to Deuteronomy, right, second giving of the law, second giving of the law, because Deutero means second, and nomos means law. So Deuteronomy is about the second giving of the law. So we find the Ten Commandments, the law of God, first of all given to us in Exodus chapter 20. And then we find in Deuteronomy chapter 5, he gives us those commandments again. And we find some things that were listed in Leviticus and Numbers that we find again in Deuteronomy. You say, well, why are they repeated? Well, those of us who are parents, do we ever have to tell our children more than once? 
Of course. God has to tell us more than once. So um, those are the first five books, the Torah, the Pentateuch, uh, written by uh, Moses. Very, very significant. And the teachings of Jesus are really founded upon the teachings of Moses. Then Joshua. Um, let me show you uh, the next map. Well, this is just what we talk, talk, talked about earlier. So Abraham, Abraham again, in the book of Genesis, Abraham lived about 2,000 years before Christ. He lived here. Uh, he went up here to the land of Haran or Haran, and then he came down in this direction, and that's where he lived. And then Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. They ended up down here in Egypt when there was a famine. That's where then Moses was born, and so a little bit of that journey. And then when Moses, in the book of Exodus, Moses led them here down here to Mount Sinai, where there God gave them the Ten Commandments and gave them a number of other instructions. They wandered in the wilderness, and we'll, we'll talk about this more later, for 40 years. They could have made that trip in, in like six weeks. They could have. But they were whining along the way. God doesn't appreciate whining. Um, he, not that he's insensitive to us. He's, he is sensitive to us when we go through struggles. Um, but it took them 40 years until finally, ultimately, they went up here and Moses died on Mount Nebo that you see up here. And, uh, and from Mount Nebo, you can walk, look across the Jordan River. You can see into the Promised Land. And they approached the city of Jericho. And that's where we pick up with the book of Joshua. Because Joshua then, uh, God told Moses, Moses, you're going to die on Mount Nebo. You're not going to enter into the Promised Land. I'm going to let you see it, but you can't go there. So Moses, Gretchen, were we together on Mount Nebo? And so we were up on Mount, Mount Nebo, and you can see it kind of it wasn't a real clear day that day. I remember it was really, really windy when we were up on Mount Nebo that day. And, uh, and so Moses could look across the Jordan, and there he could see uh, Jericho, and he could see that land that God had prepared for him. But God said, Moses, you're not going to make it across. So uh, I want you to select. He, he told him who his successor was. He didn't say, I want you to pick him. He said, it's, it's Joshua. And he made it very clear. And so Joshua then was to be the next leader. And then Joshua led the people across the Jordan River um, to, into Jericho and into the Promised Land. So under Joshua's, uh, under Joshua's leadership then, uh, the land that they took, that God gave to them, was divided by the different tribes. So we hear about the 12 tribes of Israel. And so these tribes were all families. So we're going to use the term like Jew and Hebrew and Israelite pretty much interchangeably. If you really want to get specific and nitpicky, we, we can. But for all purposes, we're going to use it in the same way. So the, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, started as a family. They were the descendants of Abraham and the descendants of Isaac and the descendants of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons. So one of his sons was Simeon, one was Judah, one was Reuben, one was Benjamin, one was Dan, one, and, and those are his sons. And, and as the sons had kids, and they had kids, and they had kids, they became tribes. So the tribes were the families. So the tribe of Simeon, the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Benjamin. And they were given certain portions of land. The Finkies are up here, right? The Arnholds are kind of, I mean, different family have their, their sections, where they farm. Um, and, and so the, the, that's kind of the way they worked it here among the people. So these different tribes represented the different families of the descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And all that was divided up under the leadership of Joshua. So Joshua became the leader of the people. And then Judges. In the days of, of Joshua, the nation of Israel. And so Joshua, Moses was around 1500 BC. Joshua would have been around 1400 BC, 1300 BC. Israel didn't have a king. Now the other nations had a king. But God said, I'm your king. I'll take care of you. Just look to me. So they had instead judges. And the judges were kind of political. They were, they were like governors over certain regions and certain areas. And they would help in decision making processes. Some of the judges were male, some of them were female. Uh, God is not, even though history has been very patriarchal, God is not. Um, God values women just as much as he values men. And, uh, but, but we find that, that there were judges who ruled over the land. And so the book of Judges talks about uh, a woman named Deborah was one of the leading judges of the, of the land. Uh, there was a guy named Samson, you know, the long hair. And Delilah was a judge. There were different judges. Ruth. 
Ruth is a little book in the Old Testament that tells a story about um, a woman named Ruth and her mother-in-law named Naomi. And Naomi had um, Naomi had a husband and two sons. And in a very short period of time, she had been widowed, and her two sons, who were adults and married but had no children, died. So in a short period of time, Naomi experienced the death of her husband and then the death of her sons. And so she went to her daughters-in-law, one named Ruth, the other, I think it was Orpah, I think, and, uh, and said to them, listen, you're young, you can find another husband's, so you can, you know, leave me, go find husbands, have kids, make a life for yourself. And Ruth said, no, uh, Naomi, uh, wherever you go, I'm going to go. And, and your people will be my people. A lot of people like to use that as a wedding text, and really it has nothing to do with marriage as much as it does about a relationship between a daughter-in-law and her mother-in-law. Now it's okay to use for a wedding text, and you can, you can preach on it in that way, but really it's about a daughter-in-law who, who vowed to be faithful and loyal and care for her mother-in-law. And as more time passed, Ruth became so, uh, she was grieving to such a degree that she just became bitter. And sometimes grief will do that. We become angry. That's part of grief. Anger is a part of grief. And so she went to her friends and she said, listen, don't even call me uh, Naomi anymore. Call me Mara. Because Mara means bitter. And when we read in, as the children of Israel were making their way up to the wilderness and they had, the water was bitter. It was the, the word Mara is used. Ru, uh, Naomi just became bitter. And sometimes in life, we may get that way. And it doesn't mean that we don't have faith. It doesn't mean we're a bad person. But grief strikes us in different ways. Sometimes grief, anytime, you know, loss and grief go hand in hand. So whether we lose a loved one, whether we lose a job, uh, we could lose our home, we could lose our health. Grief is a part of that process. God wired us up in that way. And it's not wrong or bad to be angry because of our grief or even feel bitterness. God's called us to walk alongside one another. Sometimes, you know, I, I get the impression that some people think, well, if I'm a believer, I'm not going to grieve because everything's really good and it was God's will. First of all, I don't, I don't usually use that phrase, anything's God's will anymore, unless I know what, like, it's God's will that all be saved. He tells us that. But when somebody gets cancer, when a 16-year-old dies in an automobile accident, when somebody dies of, of COVID, I don't say it's God's will. Who's to say God brought that about? So we can talk about permissive will and everything else, but the fact is that it's okay to be bitter. It's okay to be angry. And what God's called us to do is to walk alongside one another when we find ourselves in that situation. The book of Job is all about Job being being hurt and wounded and bitter and angry and his friends at least at first just sitting with him not having answers not to say get over it job come on suck it up get over it and then god provides for ruth and naomi in the end and god's faithfulness and it's really a reminder god says listen i know life is hard but i'm with you and i'm always going to be with you you can count on that and then first and second samuel you can write the name david around that because first and second samuel is very much about the life of king david uh, David, who grew up as uh, the youngest of, I think, eight boys, and he was uh, kind of the runt of the litter, but how he was the one chosen to be king, uh, to succeed the first king, and how God, and they said, he's the youngest one. And, and God and, and it says, listen, God looks at the heart. God doesn't look at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And, um, and so outward appearance is not nearly as important to God. And then uh, first and second kings, as we talk about uh, so we see how it's divided. So uh, Saul became the first king of Israel. So we had judges under, uh, under um, that group of folks for a couple of hundred years. And around the year uh, 1050 B.C. or 1100 B.C., Saul, S-A-U-L, was anointed the first king of Israel. And after him came David. David was the second king. After David then came, uh, uh, came uh, Solomon, his son. And after Solomon... Uh, uh, and it just and so we'll talk about all of that. That's what we're going to pick up um, next time. So next time, what we'll do is we will pick up there.
and we will try to make our way all the way through the New Testament in the book of, uh, in the table of contents. But I, what I want to do as we introduce all this is just to make sure that when we, we dive into the individual verses, we have some context and some background of, of what's, uh, what's all in the scriptures. So that's why we're taking the time to do that. And uh, so be patient. Uh, and then we'll, we'll jump into the lesson after that, who is God? And when he turns the spotlight on himself, uh, who is he? So if you haven't put your name on the white sheet, please do that. Um, if you, you take the Bibles, with, take your Bible with you, take your workbook with you. Uh, if you have extra Bibles or workbooks on your table, you can just set them on that table. The attendance sheet, um, uh, you can just leave that. We'll have somebody pick that up. And if you have any questions, write on your 4 by 6 card. You can do that. Let me close with a word of prayer if I can do that. Father, thank you. Uh, for this time together today. I thank you for every person in this room. I thank you for those who are going to watch uh, via YouTube or in some other way. And I pray that you would continue, Lord, to reveal yourself to us that we might come to appreciate you more fully and understand what it means to live in that relationship with you. Bring us back safely next week, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.